sin, heaven, hell, all those things. And uh, so you be serious while we're having a good time. Amen? Have a good time, but it's a serious week. And I want us to enjoy that. Brother Richie, you come. We, we're glad to have Brother Richie here. Normally, missionaries don't make an impact when they call or come by. But Brother Richie came by, got a handful of tracts and said, we're in the neighborhood. We're just going to spend an hour inviting people to your church. I like that kind of missionary. Amen? Brother Richie, you come on. Well, it's a privilege and honor to be here, and I hope you all appreciate, I'm sure you do, but I uh, hope you all appreciate and will encourage you that you need to appreciate the man of God that you have, uh, the, the fire and the passion that he has. Um, a great man, Pastor Lee Robertson, said everything rises and falls on leadership, and uh, you all have a great work, and uh, you have a great pastor, and that's, that's the reason for that. Um, we are Andy and Connie Ritchie. Um, we are missionaries to East Africa, and uh, we, we plant churches. And the reason we plant churches is because we want to see people come to hear the gospel and get saved. And uh, preacher, I remember that time I come and visited. We, we saw several folks get saved that day. And uh, that's, that's what I live for. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our background, if I could. Um, I used to be in business, and uh, I was in scrap business. I, I had me and my father and my brother. We were all in business together. And uh, we uh, were very successful um, in the end. In the early days, it was, it, was, it was a hard way to go. We worked very hard. And uh, I would have told you at that time I was saved, but I wasn't saved. And I remember a time when 2002, I was sitting in a church just like this in Xenia, Ohio, and my pastor, Dr. David McClellan, was preaching the gospel, and, and the Holy Spirit was convicting me. I was sitting right, I was in my spot, right about where this gentleman is here, right behind the preacher. That's my spot. It's me, my wife, and my three kids. We were there every Sunday. And I wasn't saved. And I remember being convicted of the Holy Spirit, preacher. And I, was, I started having this argument in my heart with God. I said, well, God, I, I, I believe all that stuff the preacher's talking about. I believe in God. I believe the Bible's the word of God. And I believe in Jesus Christ. But I never came to the point <clears throat> until then when I realized, wow, I'm a sinner deserving of hell in need of a Savior. And in 2002, in the middle of an Arby's restaurant, and at lunchtime, sitting down there with my pastor in uh, Xenia, Ohio, I called on Jesus Christ, and I got saved. Now, at that point, that was a miracle took place. And I'm sure many of you could testify, but the, the, the black heart that I had, it was a miracle that Jesus could save me. But praise the Lord, he did. And uh, he's willing to, and he, was, he loved to. But from that point, God, God uh, as I grew in the Lord, some things happened in my life. And, and, and I came to realize, as, as I grew spiritually and was in church and was soaking it up, just like you all do week after week, I, was, I realized, wow, God, you gave everything for me. And here I am working my life away for business, for for monetary gain, for success. I was really in it for the money. I just wanted to succeed. I wanted to conquer the world in the business I was in. And um, I like to think that we were on track for that, but, you know, that's another story. But we were, we were doing good, and, and the Holy Spirit just kind of pricked my heart one day and said, Andy, look around. What are you doing? And I looked around, and I said, well, not much for you, God, am I? And uh, I, I got involved in my local church, just like yours, and I was going soul winning every Saturday, and I was uh, pastor asked me to be the bus director, and, and I took over the bus ministry, and I uh, I was just having a time of my life. And it uh, came to a point when um, God started kind of talking to me about, you know, I had this uneasy feeling. It was just wasn't enough. I just, I just, God was just, he called me to preach. I remember, the, I remember the argument I had with God preacher when God was calling me to preach. Now, if you didn't know me when I was, when I, you know, teenager, I, I, would, I, wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't have been in front of nobody. And we had this big argument, just like everybody in the Bible, just most, most everybody that God ever called to preach, I had this big argument, God, you got the wrong guy. And so uh, I surrendered, and I took some of the proceeds from selling my business. I surrendered, I surrendered to God. I said, I didn't know what you want me to do, God, but here I am. I'm all yours. So we sold our business, and what happened was I, I took, had some proceeds from some, some money from the sale of our business. My father retired. He lives down in Punta Gorda now, and I, I made some mission trips. And the pictures I'm going to show you are, are some of the mission trips I've, I've taken. I've, I've been to Honduras, I've been to Cameroon, I've been to Chad and Central Africa, and the picture I'm going to show you are, are all in Kenya, uh, which, is, which is where through, through much um, pastoral counseling, godly counseling of some, some good friends, godly people, some prayer and fasting, it's where God led us to in East Africa. Um, what I'd like to do is just go, just go through some slides, and, uh, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about what we've done and where we're going to go. <clears throat> That's, um, forgot that was in there. That's my family. <laughs> Um, Y'all probably could figure that out. This is past Christmas in Chicago. It was unseasonably warm. Uh, this is just an interesting little thing I, I, I found. I thought, you know, if I find it interesting, many people probably will too. <clears throat> the continent of Africa is huge, as you can see. Inside Africa, you can fit 
the United States, India, Western Europe, Argentina, and China, and still have room left over. Just a huge continent. Um, excuse me just a minute. All right. Um, what we are doing, we start churches. All right, what every missionary should do. Um, the reason we start churches is because God calls the church the pillar and ground of truth. That's what holds up the truth, proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, and that's what the local ministry is for. And one of the things we do, here we are, uh, we, we go out uh, soul winning. We always work with national pastors, and we went out soul winning. And uh, these guys, they don't look too excited, but trust me, um, they never look excited. If you, live, you live, if you live the life that they live, you would not look excited very much either. You notice they're all wearing winter coats. I'm telling you what, preacher, it was hotter there than it is outside here today, and they wear winter coats. And uh, uh, be, being down here in Florida with y'all is kind of practice for me. I'm from Chicago, all right? Um, but uh, we love it. Here's a, I'm sorry, and that picture that picture that we just saw, forgive me, um, with those guys sitting around, they were, they were charter members of the new church we went out and started. And uh, here we went out to the open market. This is the way, one of the ways that we've started churches there in Kenya. Uh, and now in Kenya, in all over East Africa, you don't have Walmart, you don't have Publix, um, and whatever other kind of stores you have around here. You have, uh, typically you just have a big giant market. And a market could be anywhere from 5,000 to 500,000 people just spread out uh, in a field. If it's rainy, it's nasty muddy. If it's hot, it's just dry and dusty. And they, people just lay their stuff out everywhere. And that's, they go there pretty much every day because survival living there is a daily experience. No refrigeration, no electricity. So they have to go shopping for their daily sustenance pretty, pretty much every day. Here we are. We emptied the edge of the market. And we just said, hey, guys, we're going to tell you how to go to heaven. Now, this is my partner um, to the right there in the, in the, in the white shirt. That's uh, Brother Peter Morris. And the man to, the, to his back with us in the tan jacket, that's the national pastor we were working with there. That's Pastor Abiko. And it uh, didn't take but a few minutes. We said, hey, we're going to tell you to go to heaven. This whole crowd gathered around, and we gave them the gospel and preached. And those who got saved, we said, hey, guys, we're going to start a church right here in your town for you so you can grow closer to God and learn, learn more about God and learn how to share with your friends and family what you just heard from us, how they can go to heaven. And we get their names and cell phone numbers for follow-up. We tell them when we're going to have a next church service. And from that point... The, uh, the national pastor, in this case, Pastor Biko, he'll go back there every week and to pastor those people and disciple those men. Here's the church that uh, village we went to. Um, I mean, we drove for hours and hours. We got stuck in the mud on the way to this place. Oh, it, was, it was a nightmare, but uh, humanly speaking. But praise the Lord, the devil was fighting us. We got there. This church had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can tell just by looking at them, you get an, just to get an idea uh, how, how rural they are um, and how poor they are. And... Um, most of these people here in this picture here got saved. They all said they want to be part of the new church that we were starting. This gentleman here, he was in that crowd. Forgive me, I forget his name. Uh, but he was, I do remember, he was 80 years old when we came to his village and met him and gave him the gospel that day. And he heard the gospel the first time. He was so excited. And uh, he got saved. Amen. He's 80 years old. The average lifespan of a Kenyan male is 59. Oh, wow. He was 80. So God is merciful to him. For those extra years, till somebody came and gave, gave him the gospel, my burden in my heart is how many people like him are passing away daily who have no way of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's, a, here's another church. I uh, put this in here for a reason. I just want you to see a church is not a building. It's a group of people. And they are thrilled to have a place to meet. This is Pastor John Nicomi um, off to the right. One of his men he's discipling. Um, they're standing up in front of him. This is a church that we helped him start. And they just meet underneath the trees there and then pop up some little, little logs on, on stools. And they just love coming to hear the, uh, the Word of God. Another thing that we do, of course, we go soul winning. Soul winning is, if we, is when a person goes out on their own. Uh, tip, it should be organized for the church. And, uh, and, we, and go soul winning. Tell people about Jesus. Now, we do this in Kenya. I, I do it in, in, on deputation. I do it everywhere I go. All right? Um, everywhere, every, a Christian should be always telling people about Jesus. But in Kenya, we do it to disciple the, the national men as well. This is Pastor Benson kneeling down beside me. Um, he translated for me that afternoon when we were out with him in his area. Uh, and all these young men behind us, there are 14 of them, heard the gospel for, for the first time and called on Jesus Christ to be their Savior. Yeah. And through that process, Pastor Benson, of course, he was listening, translating for me, and he was learning how to, how to share his faith. That's something we run into a lot. Na uh, national men are good men. They, they, they love the Lord, but they've just never 
They've never gone out and shared their faith, and so that's just something we work with them to do. Here's there's this. I'll tell you, I got excited about this picture, and I'll tell you why. This national pastor there off to the right. Uh, we've been out soul winning in this area for uh, for about two hours. Um, wouldn't call it door knocking there. You just kind of because they don't have doors. Uh, if if they're if they're lucky, they might have a curtain or something hanging in front of it. Um, but you just go up and say, "Hey," and somebody usually they're out in the yard working or in the house, and they come out and. And uh, we were out sowing in, in the area and giving the gospel. And we met on the side of the road. And uh, we were waiting for, for Brother Peter Morris and, and the national pastor that he was with. And this, this guy off to the right of the picture with a uh, gospel tract in his hand, uh, he said, hey, let's go talk to these ladies. And I was so excited because he was catching the passion that we're trying to share with these guys. And uh, we went up there, the lady in purple right in the center, the lady to the left there in the white shirt. There were only two on the porch. And I started giving the gospel, and he was translating for me. And within just a few minutes, this whole crowd gathered around, ended up doing just a little open-air service, and everybody raising their hand said that they claimed Jesus Christ as their Savior that afternoon. <clears throat> Here's me in my dopey hat. Um, <laughs> trust me, if you were in Kenya, you wore a dopey hat, too. It's right in the equator. Uh, it's, the sun's very intense, very hot. Uh, but the village chief, there he is talking to me, heard, heard, the, heard the white man was in town. Doesn't happen very often. I've met a number of people who've never met a white man before. And uh, he, just, he just made a beeline to come say hello and welcome each of his village. They're very kind, very hospitable. Um, he's a Jehovah's Witness. They beat us to him. Oh, I hate when that happens. Uh, but it happens all too often. And he didn't get saved, but he got the gospel, and I sent him home with a gospel track. The key to winning East Africa to Christ, discipling national men. This is very important in our, in our philosophy of missions. Or that there's not enough missionaries to win East Africa Christ, let alone the world. There's not enough of me to reach Kenya, let alone all of East Africa. My vision is East Africa. All right, just like there's not enough of your pastor to reach all of St. Petersburg or your area. He needs you all to help him. He, he has meetings. He teaches you. He trains you. He organizes meetings for you all to go out and reach your community. Well, that's, that's our vision, our plan for, um, for reaching East Africa. We disciple national men to reach their own people. Men like this man right here, Pastor Biko and his precious family. And uh, this man right here. Uh, is pastoring right now six churches. When uh, we met him, he was pastoring uh, a church, and uh, we, uh, we taught him to go out soul winning. Uh, we helped him start two churches, and since that, he, he's got, man, he just got on fire after he saw what we taught him about soul winning and, and uh, set, set the heart, his heart on fire for just starting churches, and since then, he's just, gone, he's just going crazy. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in just a moment. Um, men like this, this is Pastor Solomon. This is the, uh, he's in Mombasa, the second largest city uh, in Kenya on the East Coast, pastoring a church of 150 people when we first met him. And uh, we went out soul winning his area. He'd never been soul winning before. And he, again, he translated for We've been out wor working with him for a little bit. He's translating for us, listening, watching, learning. He knew all the facts. He knew what the Bible says. He knew the verses, but he just would have never gone through the, the steps of sharing his faith in Jesus with somebody else and walking them um, to, uh, to the throne of grace, to the Jesus Christ. And here he is leading his first soul Amen. to Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what we're all about right there. Since we met him, he doubled, he, he's, he's been soul winning, he taught his people to go soul winning, he's doubled the size of his church, and he started, um, uh, forgive me, I've lost track, some of these guys, once we set him on fire, we can't keep up with them. He's somewhere in the neighborhood of six churches and a couple other Bible fellowships, he calls it, basically little house, house Bible studies. Um, this, uh, this is something else we've done across Kenya from the east to the west, um, from Mombasa all the way to Victoria Falls. Uh, we, we hold little pastor schools. Um, anybody, any, any pastors, any, any church people, any, any laymen that are serious about serving the Lord, we just, we just have a little, little one or two day Bible uh, pastor schools and teaching Bible doctrine, uh, soul winning, church planning principles. And uh, this is an example of why. Um, pastor Peter looking on there, that's Pastor Jeremiah with his face to us. Lady in green, we had a gospel service, and uh, we preached the gospel, and she came forward, came right here, and said, I want to get saved. We had just turned the service over to the national pastor. Good man, good man. And he said, all right, that's great. He said, all right, everybody go home. And we said, wait a minute. I mean, just nobody had ever given the practical teaching. We said, wait a minute. Somebody's got to take the few minutes to show this lady what the gospel says about so she can get saved. So here he is. Um, pastor Jeremiah is, is leading her... Uh, through the gospel track that we have for them in Swahili. The people we work with. I just got, just got some pictures in here just to give you an idea of what life is like and, and what the work is like, the, the environment that these people have to work with. And this is uh, Pastor Kennedy in his church. He was so proud of his church. 
I'm telling you what, he, he was so proud, he couldn't wait. He said, he, we met him on the road, he said, hey, come look at my church, come look at my church. And he took us, walked back in the field, and he was, what if your church looked like that? Kind of, it'd be kind of hard to, hard to keep the air conditioning contained, wouldn't it? This is another church that we went to and visited. Just a, just a mud hut, with, and I'm telling you what, it gets hot in some of these places. This is uh, Pastor Benson and his church. We met him a few minutes ago. We were right across the street from here. Uh, when those 14 young men got saved, there's a little restaurant they're at. But all his people, Pastor Benson and his people, we met here and talked for two days. They all meet in this little wood shack. That's the only ventilation is that door you see. Let me tell you what. When it's 100 degrees outside or more and the sun's beating down on the tin roof, <clears throat> I thought I'd better get some basting oil out and put it on me or something. Um, this is uh, Pastor Jeremiah again and his wife in the kitchen. And I, I just help, can't help but comment. Notice how sharp he's dressed. I mean, he looks pretty dapper. He has no water, no electricity, no way to shower, no closets, no bed. He lives in a mud hut, but yet when it comes to his position as pastor representing God, he's, he's first class. And uh, it's kind of hard to tell there, but uh, there's some smoke in the background, and this is why we're standing in the kitchen. This is lunch. Um, when we're working out in the bush, working with the pastors. They feed us almost every day, um, which is a great burden on them, but it's, it's something that they want to do. And this is Ugali. Uh, real quickly, ugali is just dried corn. They get corn. Again, they do this every day. Um, we eat this almost every day. This is kind of like pasta or bread might be for us. It's just their basic food uh, that they eat to survive. Um, it's corn. They lay out the corn out in the sun and dry it. They grind it up, put it in some creek water, and you don't, want, you don't ask what's in the water. You just eat it. As long as it's boiled, it's okay. And um, they boil it for about two hours, and it comes out kind of like Play-Doh. And from what I remember, it tastes kind of like Play-Doh, and they, they just eat it with their hands. Again, no silver or anything. Just, just an interesting little fact there. Um, what God has allowed us to do so, so far, God has been so good. We've seen 12 churches started, and these are all on the short-term trips that we've made. We've seen hundreds saved and baptized as a ministry of these churches, all being pastored by national men now, although some of them are pastoring anywhere from two to six churches. But there's a problem. It's not enough. The East African community population increased over 60,000 people today. It's one of the fastest growing populations in the world. Asia, Asia is, is, I think, the only one greater than that. Don't hold me to that as an absolute, but I believe that's pretty accurate. But over 60,000 added today. <clears throat> Guys, could you go to the next slide, please? Just touch the screen. Most of whom will never have an opportunity to hear the gospel in their lifetime. They don't have access to it. Here, here in Florida, in St. Petersburg, if you, want, if you want to hear the gospel, I mean, you can go to just about any city, any, town, any corner, you know, within a mile or two, you can find some way to hear the gospel. These folks have no way, unless somebody goes way out of the way, to tell them. Next, please. Our plan for the future. We want to multiply our fruit. We want to see more Pastor Bicos. We want to see uh, more Pastor Kennedys, more John Nicomis, more Pastor Jeremiah's. Next, please. This is our vision. <clears throat> we want to see churches, which is groups of people, baptized, saved by the blood, then baptized, and gathered, meeting together throughout all of East Africa. And we've got a good start on that with the 12 churches, but as I've, as I've demonstrated, there's so much work to be done. Now notice I have Somalia. I have churches marked in Somalia. If you pay anything to the news today, you might say, wow, that's not possible. Well, humanly speaking, you're right, and I might not see it in my lifetime, but uh, Master mentioned Pastor Biko. He was the short guy in the green jacket. He, on his own, after, after we, we worked with him and taught him some church starting principles, he was gone up to uh, two cities on the border of Somalia and started churches. And, and uh, what, actually, one of his church members went up there for some time of working, and uh, he called his pastor back and said, Pastor, there's no church here. There's no Jesus here. Will you come start a church? And he's already pastoring four churches. And he's got one of his men out of his church went up to work and said, hey, Pastor, will you come up here and start a church so people can learn how to get saved? And uh, those churches, one's in the city of Wajir and the other's in the city of Garissa. If you were to go home and Google Garissa, you would see that there's a lot of violence there from uh, some Muslim groups. Um, one's called Al-Shabaab, is probably the most prominent. His churches have had suffered real, genuine persecution. He's had some of his church people die because of their faith in Christ. Next, please. How are we going to accomplish this? We're going to start a pattern church, a New Testament, independent, fundamental, soul-winning, Bible-believing, hell-hating, King James-using, gospel-preaching church, as every church should be. Amen? Next, please. 
out of that local church, we're going to start a Bible college. And we're going to train students to plant churches and operate mobile training centers. Um, we, we've seen this, a, a prototype of this in India. Um, this, you, you probably won't hear about it from too many missionaries. It's just a concept we have in our head that we see somebody else doing in India. That's something we want to do. And I'll demonstrate that uh, here in a few minutes. Next, please. <clears throat> this little girl, we met her when we were out soul winning. And uh, her sister got saved. But obviously she's too young to hear the gospel. And it broke my heart because she, re she, re she resembles or represents tens of thousands of villages throughout East Africa. Over 550 unreached people groups in East Africa who will never have a chance to hear the gospel and are going to go to hell unless they hear that Jesus loves them. Jesus died for their sins. And after three days, he proved he was God, proved he was able to save them by rising, raising from the dead and offers them a free gift of heaven. They'll never have a chance to hear that. Let me just give you a practical example. All right. What's your name, sir? Mark. Mark. All right. Mark represents, just for illustration, he represents Pastor um, John Nicomi. All right. We met Pastor John Nicomi. We taught him how to start a church, and uh, he was already start pastoring one. We taught him the idea of hey, you, have, you have a vision, you have a passion. We set him on fire. He went out. He not only started a church here, he came over here and started a church right over here. All right, let's just say this represents a village. So now this man, Pastor John Nicomi, John, right? Sure. What are, pa, call, Pastor John those. Nicomi, whatever his name is. Pastor John Nicomi for this illustration. Right? So he's over here. He's pastoring his church. Now he's, pa, he's he started another church. And while he's pastoring this church, he's teaching somebody how to be a pastor so that eventually he can move on. All right? So while this work is going on, I come over here, and I meet, um, I meet Pastor Biko. Pastor Biko. And Pastor Biko, now he takes off, man. He comes over, he's pastoring his church. And he started a church in Wajir. He started a church in the Garissa. And he started uh, three other churches as well. So all these, all these areas, all these villages, Pew represents a village, just for illustration. Now, there are, all these villages now here, they're getting the gospel. They're being reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? And the missionary, me, all right, I'm, not, I'm not here. I'm moving on. I kind of think we see that in Paul, in Acts with Paul, okay? And, and then we come over here and... Uh, I meet Pastor Jeremiah, and Pastor Jeremiah, how you doing, Pastor Jeremiah? You're doing a great job, man. Thank you. you know what? You need to get a little fire, though. I mean, I know you've been doing a great job pastoring, but, uh, but you've got people around you that, aren't, that, that don't know that you're here, that don't know how to go to heaven. Pastor Jeremiah, you need, you need to get on fire, go soul winning, teach your people how to go soul winning, and then after that, you need to come over here and start another church over here, okay? So now that's happened. That's Pastor Jeremiah. So now we've reached, just for sake of illustration, we've reached this side over here with what we've done so far, Okay? I'm just trying to draw a picture for you. Problem is, 60,000 people every day being added to this group over here. No church, no gospel, no witness. So our vision is to start the pattern church, to train men to go out and reach village after village after village. And uh, I ask of you, yea, I beg of you, pray for us. We need your prayers. Preacher, I'm almost done. Um, we need your prayers on behalf, not for us, on behalf of what represents this whole section of people who are dying and going to hell. And that's hard to get our minds around. But if we read the Bible, that's what's happening. If we believe the Bible, that's what's happening. And by the way, I do. Or otherwise, I wouldn't surrender my life to go to Africa and drag my wife off to East Africa. Um, by the way, I pray for my wife. She's never been to Africa. She's been to Honduras, and when we, after about two weeks, she said, Honey, get me out of here. <laughs> All right. But just pray for us. Pray that God will get us there. Pray that God will use us to see multitudes saved, not through my work, but through the work that God uses me to do to train others to reach their own people. Amen. Pastor, thank you. Amen. Take your hymnals, if you would, please. We'll turn to hymn number... Um, Turn over here, hymn number 215. I'd like to do something different. We're all going to sing the first verse together, and the words are also on the screen. Let's, uh, um, on the second verse, I'm going to have the men sing the second verse. On the third verse, we'll have the ladies sing the third verse, just the third verse. On the fourth verse, the instruments are going to drop out, and we're all going to sing together and lift our voices on the, on the last verse there. So the first verse, we'll all sing together. The second verse will be just the men. The third verse will be just the ladies. The fourth verse 
be uh, everyone together without your instruments. Let's have everyone stand as we sing, My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. Ready? My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. I've a just redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now all the men. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee Just the ladies on the third. Very good. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Abiku. <laughs> Take your Bibles, the book of Colossians, please. Chapter number one, page 1262. If you use an old school field Bible, we'll pick up reading where we read this morning, and I'll finish uh, this morning's thought. First, um, let me just say how much I appreciate uh, Brother uh, Richie's encouragement for soul winning brother uh, David Hall and I were just talking today that uh, we must be better soul winners we must look for more opportunities and uh, creative ways to share Christ but uh, the main thing about uh, Acts 1 8 is go uh, that's the first part of it and uh, for many of us we don't win souls because we don't go we don't share our faith and uh, so I appreciate encourage me brother Richie appreciate that so much look at verse number Nine, and we'll read down through verse 14 and have a word of prayer together. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. We desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom, spiritual understanding. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. This morning we began this message, and we'll finish tonight as we study through the book of Colossians together, that Epaphras had brought the message of encouragement to the Apostle Paul. 
And that triggered in Paul the letter to the church at Colossae where he encourages them with what he is praying for them. And he said, since Epaphras came, we've not stopped praying for you. And then he made the statement in verse number 9 that his desire was for certain things in their life. And we began this morning to talk about what Paul's desire was. And he said, we want you to have these things. And again, I'm not the Apostle Paul, but as a pastor, uh, I desire so many of these same things for you. And I want you to know these things. I don't want you to experience faith from my point of view, but I want you to experience faith from your point of view. Listen, everybody's got to have a personal faith. And uh, it's not enough to say uh, what others have. Uh, Where's your faith at? And what do you have? And so Paul said, number one, we got through the first three. He had a desire that they were filled with knowledge, wisdom, and spiritual understanding. Find the will of God for your life and pursue it with all your heart. Uh, We talked about that this morning and talked about wisdom and how that we must have uh, wisdom. Uh, We must have spiritual understanding. It's not going to get easier to navigate these very troubled world issues that we live in. And uh, we've got to have understanding and wisdom. And number two, we said a desire to walk worthy uh, of the Lord unto all pleasing. Uh, Let our walk match our talk. Uh, Let our walk be worthy of the name of Christ. And he said, I want you to walk not as you were, but as you are. And I want God's light to shine through you uh, that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And I'd like to develop that point some more because I think that there was so much we could have talked about this morning. But here's the deal. People ought to see something different about you. But really it's not something different. It's someone different. And if you act like the world and talk like the world and look like the world and go where the world goes and does what the world does, uh, you're a billboard for the world. Uh, But a Christian ought to act like a Christian. And and we we ought to act worthy of this name. Uh, I'm kind of proud that I'm my daddy's boy. Uh, I'm not uh, ashamed to be a stancil. But I'm even more proud to be a child of God. And I want to represent my daddy earthly and my daddy heavenly uh, well. And so there's a desire for Paul, uh, for this church at Colossae to walk worthy. And then number three, we said this morning, uh, there's a desire... To be fruitful in every good work. Listen, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it well. I don't want to have a Sunday school class that's mediocre. Uh, years ago, we, we, uh, we, we looked at our bus ministry. And uh, I just felt like that we needed to, to do something about it. I said, if we're going to run a bus, we ought to fill it up. If I give you a, a class to teach a class, it ought to be a full class. It costs the same money to cool a full class as it does an empty class. It costs the same money to run a bus whether there's 10 kids on it or 50 kids on it. And if we're going to do church, we ought to do it well. God ought to bless us. And if we're going to be a businessman, and whether it's a secular man hauling junk and, and, uh, or, or if it's whatever it may be, we ought to do it for the glory of God. You say, preacher, why? So that God can bless our work. And so that we can get more to do more. Listen, this is not about, God is not a uh, a struggling economy God. God wants to do something in your life, something marvelous. And I'm about tired, this is the introduction, I'm going to pray and be done in a minute. I'm about tired of Christians that poor mouth God. Oh, I don't know. Oh, ye of little faith. Is God broke? Is God not in the miracle business? And so we we need to say, God, I want to do this, and I want you to be magnified. And again, let's be careful. It's not about us, but we serve a good God. I stand amazed at how big and how good our God is. And let's do this thing for God's honor and glory. Father, bless the remainder of the message. We pray be with Ed as they sing. Prepare our hearts for worship now. Prepare our hearts to listen to the message Thank you for Brother Richie to challenge and stir us about the matter of being a gospel witness. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Now look at the end of verse number 10. We continue point number 4 in our study. Look at verse number 10, the end. He said, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul's desire was that there would be an increase in a knowledge of the Lord. An increase in the knowledge of God. So brother says, how do you get an increase? How do, you, how do you get more knowledge of God? Well, most of us would say you would study. And we'd agree to that, right? We'd say, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I agree with that statement as a beginning. But do you know how you increase your knowledge of God? It is not simply a study of God or a study of theology. I know a lot of smart men that know about God. They've written books. They, they've taught in seminaries and universities, and, and they know a lot. They can parse the Greek, and they can go back and break down the Hebrew. And, and, and I remember Brother Hudson years ago at Forest Hill said, I know a little Greek, and I know a little Hebrew. One runs a tailor shop, and one runs a delicatessen. Amen. But uh, that was a long time ago. But, but I, I thought about that a lot as I was thinking about this thought. God is not learned from a book. God is learned from faith. The just shall live by their faith. Do you, do you want to know how to learn about God and learn who God is? Put God to the test. By faith. Let me ask you a question. Uh, there, there is a faith that you can learn in theology, but it does not become practical faith until it's tested in reality. How many of you believe that David thought God was a big God? Oh, yeah. How many of you know after Goliath, David knew God was a big God? How many of you thought maybe Gideon knew that God was a 
big God. But after the great victory with 300 men, he knew God was a big God. How many of you thought, and we could go on and on about men uh, and women in the Bible that said, oh yes, I believe God. But then they had to prove God. And they went through the fire, they went through the crucible, they went through the test as it was, and they came out on the other side and said, listen, I don't just think God's a big God, I know God's a big God because I've seen God move mountains on my behalf. My wife and I, uh, when, uh, when I got right with the Lord, I got back in church, and, and I went off to Bible college. I went back to the college that I had last been semi, I don't even know the term, but it was just where I needed to start back again. And I went back to college, and I was wrestling with God. You know my testimony. I was willing to be a teacher but not a preacher because my thought pattern was that if a teacher failed, then it wouldn't be big, uh, near as big a deal if a preacher failed. And so I had a bargain to deal with God where I'd go be a teacher uh, and work with kids in Christian school and football and baseball and basketball and all that. And it was at college that I met my beautiful wife and we began to date and we got married. And uh, uh, that next year of marriage was the year of my wrestling. It's kind of like Jacob's wrestling with God. That whole year I was trying to become a husband but also I was wrestling with God about the call of God on my life and God was calling me again he had already called me at the age of nine I have the letter in my office a little note I wrote that told the date and all that that I got called to preach as a nine-year-old boy at a revival meeting on a Tuesday morning I'll never forget it clear as the day I remember the text I remember the preacher I remember everything and I remember saying yes God I'll preach but here I am, a 25-year-old man, and arguing with God. Long series of events. I'll shorten a year-long story into just a few moments. I surrendered to preach, and then uh, I said, okay, God, I'll go train and get my ministry training, and then I'll go preach. And, and the surrendering to preach was the first step, but then where to go was the second step. And the uh, long story, and again, I'll narrow it down. I'll tell you some other time if you haven't already heard it, but uh, there was the call and the clear, the clear call, the clear touch of God for us to go to uh, Midwestern Baptist College to finish our degree. I called my wife, said, we're going to go. And she said, I'll start packing. She said, are you sure? I said, yes. She said, let's go. We left for Midwestern Baptist College, and that began a journey from theology in the books to theology in my life. And I'll tell you this, and I'll stand here to be, to be honest. I learned more about God outside of the classroom than I did in the books of the classroom. You go off to Bible college with just you and your wife, don't know a soul. Don't know anything, don't have much money. I don't, baby, how much money did we leave it? It wasn't a thousand dollars, I don't think. It was half that or so. But but all of a sudden, God began, I could tell you probably 10 stories in the next 10 minutes of how God did miraculous things for us, including a place to live, including money to pay the first month's rent, including people that worked bargains with us where you don't have any money, but you can work. Okay, we'll trade you rent for work. How many times we did that? Didn't have any money. But people said, okay, we won't take any money. Just do this. And we said, praise the Lord. I learned practical theology. You'll never, listen, I love you to death. I'd like to kill some of you. (laughs) You will never learn what you need to learn about God until you step out of the Sunday night service, the Sunday morning service, the Wednesday night service, and start putting God to the test in your life. You'll never learn until you start out giving what you think you can afford. You'll never learn about how big God is until you step out the first time to pass out a gospel tract or witness to someone or go on a missions trip that may end up changing your life. Some of you, oh, I, I couldn't go. You never know. That may be the trip. I've got a man that's in the United Kingdom right now, and i got a man in Southern California right now, both preaching, both serving God because of a missions trip where God radically changed their life. One, same trip, two men. I'm just telling you, the knowledge of God is not studying more books. And by the way, I I am a reader, and you know I love to read. But reading about God without ever practicing what you read about God does not increase your faith. Listen, it twists your faith. Much of what we have today is not practical theology. It is a book-learned theology. And a lot of these guys that are writing books and are leading a, a, a lot of folks in weird directions theologically, they're men that have never experienced God's blessing and work and power. It's just something they think about God. The only way to know about God is to put God to the test. I wonder if a man can walk on water. 
We'd never know if a man could walk on water until Peter stepped out of the boat. By the way, can you imagine sitting around with Peter drinking coffee after that? What'd you do Tuesday? Oh, I went to the store. What'd you do? Walked on water. <coughs> Excuse me? Yeah, I walked on water. By the way, wasn't a placid, calm lake. It was a raging sea. I cut on across there. Now, I had a little bobble at the end, but I walked on water. By the way, oh, Peter, he failed God. Peter had faith. Peter's the only man in the world ever walked on water. I would rather try and stumble than never try at all. A lot of people, because of the fear of failure, they'll never attempt success. You're never going to succeed till you get out of the boat. I, I could go back through. I'd like to I'd take a whole message, preach on that right there. But, but some of us are at the place, and I believe this is where many of you are. It's a, it's a journey. The Christian life is a wonderful journey. And never think because you've arrived at one place that there's not another, another goal or another mountain to climb. And here's where a lot of you have come. You've gotten saved. Uh, you've, you've been obedient in baptism. You've really begun to develop and grow in your faith. And you are at the, the chasm where you think, well, uh, the, I've arrived at a spiritual condition that I think is okay. And, and you have come. But listen, it's time to go to the next next level spiritually by the way churches go through that and we are going to preach a while here I've changed my mind churches arrive at that where if a church doesn't by faith step out of the boat they're going to begin to die you ever seen an empty church building I don't know but I think the saddest thing in the world to me is a place in Atlanta called the tabernacle it's in downtown Atlanta Georgia it's called the Tabernacle. It is one of the biggest rock and roll venues in all of Atlanta. It's called the Tabernacle, Atlanta, Georgia. It's a rock concert. It's a rock hall. We have concerts there. All the big names coming. All the craziness goes on. Why is it called that? Isn't that a weird name for a rock venue, the Tabernacle? Well, considering that the Tabernacle back in the day was the gospel preaching center of Atlanta, the Tabernacle got its name as a rock venue because the promoters bought it from a dead church. And I could take you down to every major city in America to a dead church, and I could take you to scores around this part of the country. And what happened was God birthed the church. By the way, in the early days of a church, there's excitement. Now, I'll say this, and I don't mean, I don't mean this in any way. I look back now, I don't mean this as an as a insult, it's not, and you, you that are going to understand this are going to get this, but I look back to those early days of our ministry when we were just trying to rebirth a dead, I mean we were dead as a post when I got there. And God began to do some things in Texas. And, and all of a sudden, man, we began to, to literally rebuild a church. And Brother Bagwell kind of gave that story on Monday a little bit about what God did at their church. Those were hard days. And man, you're talking about labor-intensive days and difficult days. But I promise you, I'll live a long time before I have any better days. Because every day was starting churches. You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Well, who's going to show up today? We ain't got no money. We ain't got no money. We ain't got nothing. But you got God. And man, there's a zeal, there's excitement, and everything was a big deal. Man, we're going to buy our first this, and we're going to get our first that. And, and all of a sudden, you realize we, we got to have God if we're going to do anything. And boy, those early days are fun days. You, then you get a little successful, and all of a sudden, things begin to come along, and, and you have a little success, and you get enough money to pay the light bill this month. It's, I've been there, done that so many times. Oh, God, pay the light bill this month. And, and all of a sudden, thing, money, and churches go from fast forward to fifth gear to kind of a cruise control, and God brings a challenge and says, now, Go forward, sir. I don't, we don't want to go forward. We're settled where we are. Sam Davidson preached a message years ago called Settled on Your Lees. And it's a reference to how uh, juice, wine uh, settles. The, sed the, the sediments will settle down. And he talked about Christians and churches that just settled. They, they weren't shaken up anymore. They weren't, they weren't aggressive anymore. Christians and churches and ministries and places like that they come to those moments in time where either we're going to step out to a new revelation of who God is or we're going to be content with where we are some of you young Christians I'm so proud of you I can't hardly stand it what I've seen God do in your life but listen you haven't arrived you just arrived at the next challenge point it's a faith point brother Keith faith point 
and, 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 and what you've got is you've got the next thing. And you say, man, it's, it's, un, it's unknown to me. May I remind you of something? What you're doing now was unknown to you two months ago, three months ago, a year ago. Some of you, uh, some of you are buying your first suit, praise God. Brother Rich, man, if y'all haven't been following the, the, I'm sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you, Brother Rich, but if you haven't, I'm going to embarrass you, Brother Rich. Uh, if you haven't been following the suit purchase, Brother Rich buying a suit. He's narrowed it down, got it nailed down to a pinstripe blue suit. He, 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 uh, we are talking at lunch today, he said, just it's, it, in person, and I get, I get all this. It's a big deal, preacher, it's just a big deal. Now, to you and I, that's not a big deal, is it? Hundreds of suits over the years. We've suits, suits, suits. Two years ago, the only suit he ever would need was if somebody would have died and it aborted that. This suit's now for church and for preaching and for ministry. You say, preacher, it's a new world. Yeah, but two years ago, church was a new world. So, so don't get afraid of your new horizon because just a little bit ago the place you are right now was a new horizon we we're so aren't you glad june pendleton's home from world traveling don't ever leave again june just stay faithful june we asked june to to take a new role and and like everybody we asked to take a new role in the church oh oh get a little nervous you know but then she's like i'm in and she's in but i remember when she first got saved i wasn't here but she was kind of a new christian when i got here and and all of a sudden now Bible clubs, now that's, that's old hat, isn't it? And you go to Bible clubs and, and church attend and all that. I'm just saying whatever you're going to next is a new thing. But whatever you're doing now was a new thing not too long ago. And you'll never know more about God if you don't test him. Has he been faithful up till now? Well, yeah, he's been faithful. What, what, what do you think he wouldn't be faithful tomorrow for? Well, it's new. It's not new to God. God lives in the eternal present. Nothing's going to surprise him. He already has your way planned. He knows your ending from your beginning. He knows the thoughts he thinks toward you. The thoughts of peace, not of evil. To give you an expected end. God's saying, look, church. Look, Christian. Launch out. Step out. Uh, get out of your comfort zone. Go a little farther. Why? Because all of a sudden, you're going to find out God is bigger than you think. <clears throat> one point that's pitiful but I'm so sick of y'all saying I'm long winded I'm under conviction four years ago May we, we came to to, uh, to this church community and uh, it, it was uh, it was it was not at all our plan. In fact, we really felt like, to be very honest, that we were we were just in the middle. We certainly felt like there was much more to do. In fact, we were in uh, we were trying to finish up a, an apartment building that we built. We'd already built one apartment building on the campus for staff members and for retired folks and just different people in the church had need. We had a lot of land there, and we needed to use it wisely. So we built a four unit, and we were finishing up another four unit, and we were uh, finishing up a gymnasium. We had, we had got the frame up, and we had to get the inside done. And so we had we'd borrowed money. We'd come out of the last hurricane we'd gone through. And it, it was, to me, not good timing when you called. Uh, in fact, it just, in fact I, I just knew the minute I got the call that it was not God's will because, to me, the timing wasn't right. I felt God should wait until we finished the project. I, I, I hated the idea of leaving in the project, I, I just and I felt like the church was uh, happy birthday, sweetie. I felt like the church was uh, just now really beginning to hit its right. In fact, to be honest, for nine years we kind of labored in growth, and then the last three years we were there, the church exploded. It, it became something that it, it we'd, we'd always wanted to be, and it really was. It was just a sweet time. And so when we when we uh, when we got the call about Matt leaving and about uh, this church, I knew it wasn't God's will because it just wasn't time. It wasn't, and I knew God had some things. Long story, fast forward, we began to, to, to pray and to, and to really seek the Lord. I've had to grow in my personal faith, in my pastoral 
leadership and my preaching in ways that I don't know that I ever would have grown. I'm not saying I wouldn't have grown. I'm not saying we wouldn't have continued to be blessed. But it's just been a different need set here. God brought me to here perhaps for just the fact that I needed to get out of a comfort zone and see if God was still God in Florida or not. I knew God was God in Texas, but would God be God in Florida? And would God use us here? And I don't know. I, I don't know. We, we haven't written the final chapter of that, but it's been a pretty good four years so far. We've kind of seen God do some neat things. We've gone through some troubles and some difficulties, but God's proven himself strong. You ever think that God's trying to teach you that he's big enough for whatever you're dealing with? If you'll let him. God wants you. God's desire for you. Paul's desire. My desire. I don't want you to be comfortable. In your limited knowledge of who God is. See if God's big enough to do the next thing. So brother Sam said. I don't know if I can. Well I'm pretty confident you can't. But I am very confident that he can do all things. And you can do all things through him. So as God is taking you. Through the process. To go to the next place. Let him. And what you're going to find is. The new thing will become the old thing. Soon enough. And then there will be another new thing. You'll say well I don't know about the new thing. Remind yourself. The new thing. Is going to be like the old thing. That was the new thing. At some point. For you and I buying a suit. That ain't no big deal. But it's the new thing. But how do we know the new thing's going to work? Because God's been faithful in the old thing. Let me give you this last challenge. God's already proven himself mighty in ways that you and I will never understand. Whatever tomorrow holds, God's going to show himself strong. You know how we're going to learn that? By launching out, stepping out on faith. Saying, God, I don't know how this is going to work. If you can figure God out, it ain't God. If you can figure it out, if you can, if you can budget it out, if you can balance it out, it ain't God. God only does things by faith. And you know what you do? When you step out, you learn God's a big God. Say, so preacher, I read my Bible and I pray every day. Well, how are you going to learn about God? Put into practice what you've read. Does Acts 1-8 still work? I don't know. Let's go witness and I see. Is God still doing great works in churches? I don't know. Let's try and see. Is God still promising to, to bless above measure, pressed down, shaken out, running over, that if we would give, would men give back to our bosom? I don't know, but let's see. The only way to learn about God is not from a book. It's from a practical application of what you've learned in the book. Sunday is not the goal. Sunday is preparation for the goal. The goal is Monday through Friday. Now, I'll tell you what we've learned this week and go put into practice next week. We desire to see God increase, I see you increase in your knowledge of God. I'm going to go to Michigan, see if God's in Michigan. You know what I found? God was in Pontiac, Michigan, of all places. I thought God had abandoned Pontiac, Michigan. And we were, we were doing pretty good in Pontiac, and then I found out God was in Groves, Texas. Just never thought you'd find him on the Gulf Coast. Here. And then I found out God's still in St. Petersburg, Florida. By the way, I think we're going to find out God's in East Africa. I'm not real sure, but I think God's in East Africa. And God may be where he's sending and leading you next. Father, we love you. May we increase in our knowledge of you by expressing our faith, demonstrating a trust that only you can provide what we need. Pray for that one tonight that's, that's uh, wavering on a decision. Lord, may by faith he or she step out. By by faith, may this church step out, not to do the foolish, but to, to do the faithful. And God, you'll bless a church that leads by faith. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us now. Bless the invitation, our time. Heads are but eyes are closed. Brother Mark's going to lead us in a song in just a moment. Let me ask you a question. What is your faith point? So, brother, I'm very comfortable where I am. Comfortable is not a place that a Christian needs to stay. We need to be content that means that wherever we are, that's where God wants us, and we're fine with that. But we need to be always seeking to live by faith. Is God 
moving your faith point to a greater level. Some of you, it's salvation. That's where you need to go. Some of you, it's obedience and scriptural baptism. That's where you need to go. Some of you, it's church membership. That's your next faith point. Some of you, is service. Some of you, is commitment in other levels. Some of it, whatever it may be, God's got a faith point. And it's always, as you move, it always grows with you. Why don't you come tonight and say, God, by faith, that thing that you're touching my heart about, that thing you're going to present to me this week, by faith, I'm going to go for it. Trusting you and giving you all glory, honor, and praise. Let's stand to our feet. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Mark is going to lead us in a song. You step out of your place. Increasing our knowledge of faith, of God. I know our Come church every soul by sin oppressed there's mercy with the Lord Increasing our knowledge and of him. he will Only surely by demonstrating our faith in give you rest by trusting in his word Only trust him only trust him only trust him now he will save you he will save you folks are praying he will save Won't you come listen now. god will scare you to death but he'll never fail you you can't always trace you can't always see sometimes you think he's not doing anything that's when he's probably doing some of the biggest things by faith just step out and trust him. We'll sing another verse. You step out of your place. You come. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in him without delay, and you are full. Trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now. To the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust him, sing now. Only trust him, only trust him now. He will never, he will save you, he will save you. He will save you. Look up here real quick. Folks are praying. Just to thank you, Rebecca. Uh, just uh, Hayden just had a question about faith. And, and let me just, I need to explain that. I think that's a good point that he brought up. As a child, as a young person, you, you don't have huge faith things. You have small faith things. David, as a child, was under the umbrella of his father Jesse's protection. But then God began to open it up, lions and bears. Those are those, are those oh, I don't know, it's not a life or death thing. You know how you prepare for life or death things with little things? Now, as you graduate high school, as Hayden has done, and some of these other young people are transitioning, all of a sudden you step out of that umbrella of dad's faith. And it's not that you don't have faith, you just haven't seen God do that big faith stuff yet because you're living with mom and dad's faith. There's not a problem with growing up in a faith-filled home, and you're not in danger of never experiencing it. It's just it's a process. So, so don't worry if you haven't had your giant killing moment yet. You've had enough growing up to learn from others that when it is time for you to step out, you'll do that. So if you haven't had your big move to Michigan story yet, I didn't have it either till I moved to Michigan. Well, you don't move to Michigan when you're 16, 12. 11 but you do but you do have faith 
when it's trusting your mom and dad's faith and it's trusting their instruction and you're making a decision and you're like, well, Lord, I don't understand about this, but mom and dad think it's a good idea. That's developing faith. And then that transitions into your own faith. All right, so just, just don't, don't worry yet if you had not killed any giants. It's coming soon enough. Yeah. Kill a few lions and bears along the way. We'll get to giants later. Good. Here's these good-looking ushers and Bob. <laughs> Amen. Father, bless the offering. May we be faithful in our giving, our missions giving, our work here, St. Pete, around the world. I pray, God, you'd bless us. May we be faithful in that which you've given us, that we might use it for the furtherance of the gospel here, around the country, and around the world. And the Lord, even this week, again, we, we pray for VBS. May it be a gospel week where boys and girls hear the good news of Christ and, uh, Lord, we don't have to go to East Africa anymore to find boys and girls that have never heard about Jesus. We can go into these highways and hedges right around us locally and find boys and girls that have never heard who Jesus is. So help us this week to do a, a faithful job in trying to share you with others. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you as you give. Turn and follow Christian road Though other folks may tell you no They say there's too many things you'll be missing If you go that way Keep your eyes looking straight ahead Stay on that narrow path instead For the road they're telling you to take Someday will come to an end I know it seems like they're having fun And there's many things that you haven't done But believe me when I say There's something far greater ahead For those who turn on Christian road Someday their feet will walk on streets of gold There'll be a place awaiting them In the kingdom up in glory land in the kingdom, in glory land, that's where I long to be. With my creator and his only son, he gave his life for me. And there will be peace and love and everlasting life, and sin will be no more. For those who turn on Christian road will find it leads to heaven's door. And there's a kingdom in glory land where someday we all should be. With our creator and his only son, he gave his life for you and me. And there will be peace and love and everlasting life. And sin will be no more For those who turn on Christian road Will find it leads to heaven's door And take his mighty hand And turn on Christian road He'll guide you straight to heaven's door Won't you follow Christian road I mean, just got a note, uh, Larry uh, sits right here in the wheelchair, just came out of NICU and is doing much better. So praise the Lord for that. We rejoice. And if you'd like to go, he's at Northside Hospital. Uh, if you'd like to go by and see him, Brother Willard has the room number 326, but you be in prayer. Now, let me remind you of a couple things. We're going to have a vac vacation Bible school meeting. Uh, Julie, is that going to be Barnard Hall? So if, uh, if you are working Vacation Bible School this week, go down to Barnard Hall right after the service, have a quick meeting with you. And again, because it's the conference camp season, uh, if you want to help sponsor someone for camp, see Paul, Tyler, or myself. Uh, don't just give money because we want to keep track of who's doing what, where, so that we know that nobody's being taken advantage of or, or that we're not missing somebody, all right? Uh, also, uh, if you could still maybe drop by uh, cookies or cheese balls, anything that's visually stimulating, two-liter drinks, uh, a lot of stuff want to fill the platform. That motivates the kids 
by seeing what they could win, uh, to listen, pay attention, uh, and to participate. So drop that off tomorrow, anytime during the week, but uh, we want to fill this place up. more visually stimulating it is, the better their attention is. And I noticed some of y'all are looking at the cookies too. But anyway, uh, also uh, dessert auction. We're trying to raise money to help our kids with fuel and different things for their camp. And a dessert auction on the night of the 23rd. Bring some extra money with you. Stay for the auction. It's always a good time. You'll, you'll want some of the desserts. There's a lot of creativity. A lot of fun goes in that. Teens doing an all-nighter, and the Single Vision Conference is right around the corner. Just a few more weeks for Single Vision, and uh, we'll have young people from all over the country, all over the world here, and it's going to be a great week, so pray for us about that. And then Marty also, don't forget her CDs of uh, hymn music are in the back, available. You can get that. Uh, Brother Richie will be in the back with his wife. You can go by and meet them. And the VBS guys, you're going that way. Anything I've forgotten? Anything I've forgotten? We are going to do this Wednesday night. Normally, we, we, we have a difficulty. Some of you show up for Wednesday night church, and we got all the Vacation Bible School. You're welcome, by the way, to come to Vacation Bible School. But Brother Dan will be having a small group in the cube on Wednesday night uh, for any adults that want to do a Bible study there, uh, and you don't want to come and participate uh, in the VBS. So there will be a service. It'll be a small service. It won't be long at all, but uh, just some of you enjoy that. Or come in here and, and take part in what's going on. It's going to be a great week. Looking forward to it. I'm going to be going to uh, preach revival this week out in West Tennessee. If you'd pray for me, I really want the Lord to do something. Uh, I've been praying a lot about this. Here's a young church, a pastor trying to really get it moving in the right direction. And I want to be a blessing to them and teach them about soul winning. Teach them about just reaching. You know, if a church, if every member in one calendar year reached one, one non-member, one outside person, church would double every year. All you got to do is reach one. If everybody reached one, a church would double every year. Not a multitude, one person. And uh, I'm going to challenge the church that in one year they could double if everybody reached somebody. Just got them saved, baptized, and in church. And uh, you could turn that church upside down. By the way, if we doubled in size, could you imagine the impact we'd have on this community for Christ? So uh, pass out a tract to somebody this week. Be an encouragement to somebody. Invite them to church. Most of all, tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, make a difference in somebody's life. By the way, uh, tonight and Wednesday, uh, Amanda and Buddy, they're moving to Ohio. So this is Amanda's last Sunday night. They'll be here uh, I think Wednesday night, and then they'll be moving to Ohio. So I've been very, very faithful, both uh, Buddy and Amanda. So you love on them a little bit before we go. All right, let's all stand together. Anybody else? I forget anything? All right. I love you. I'll see you this weekend. God bless you. By the way, don't forget the Worley family and the death of Wally and uh, our family and the death of Mama. Pray about that. God bless you. I love you. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.